third call for March would be a discussion. Well, the moth on the <coughs> normally a uh, uh, normal brown vest moth will we'll find the regimental number on the battle, and then on discussion we'll see a mark, uh, which they refer to as the British fraction. And the upper mark usually is the company, and the second mark, the mark below, is the, uh, the private number as his name appeared on the sergeant's mark of the board. So kind of a rudimentary uh, inventory system. However, yeah, these guns got moved around. To be a member of uh, so they weren't really holding them. In other words, private. They weren't saying the private. You have number 24, you should have number 24. Yeah, that's called the British uh, fraction. Uh, that was the British fraction. Yeah, that's the British fraction. Can you give a brief description of how, they, how the British procured those guns and the manufacturing of them? Sure. Well, I guess let's start with the, uh, uh, the ordinance system of manufacture. What happened is that uh, King, King, King George I took over England in 1714. And at that time, he found his much heralded army to be basically a loose group of independently owned and operated regiments. Maybe something like a modern franchise, I think. See, in the early years of the 18th century, the uh, British Army was run on something called the purchase system. And that meant that if you were, say, a captain, say you were a general, they consider you a general, and you wanted to be a captain, you could go to a captain, you could buy his commission. And you would become a captain. The commission was something that was granted by the king and was considered as personal property. It could be bought and sold. And when agents in London making money buying and selling military commissions on a, on a, on a regular basis. Now, the way the system worked, that you'd give one of these colonels, he would own a regiment. You would give him, they would give him a set amount of money to produce 500 soldiers with red coats and big guns. And how he got there was up to him. He had total control of what he spent on this regiment. A gun, his, his musket, was the most expensive piece of equipment that he had. Consequently, there were some really, the regiment was walking around with some very cheap, lousy muskets. Now, this guy, George I, was a German. That's so how they worked at the hand office. He was a German, he couldn't even speak English, he was the king of English. But he was a firm believer that a soldier with a substandard musket was a substandard soldier. So he decided to do something about it. He ordered the British ordinance to find some way to get some great, greater quality control of these weapons. Now they tried lots of programming schemes, if you will, but that with very little uh, success because the colonels were damn annoyed that this was getting this money was getting taken away from this is a major source of income, these cheap guns. And the and the gun makers that were making them uh, is very lucrative arms trade. So it wasn't until 1727 that the ordinance finally hit on something. They call it the, the ordinance system of manufacturing. We call it now the ordinance system of manufacturing. And what they would do is they would send their inspectors out through the Midlands of England, from Birmingham mostly, with a steel mill as well. And instead of buying complete guns, they would buy musket components. They would go to a, a gun maker and they'd say, um, give us 500 locks, just like this, the lock of the firing mechanism. And they tell them at various times during the manufacturer the lock, we're going to come in and inspect it. If you like what we see, boom, we put a mark on it. At the end of the contract, they're only going to pay for all the locks. They got the box. They go to another gun maker and do the same thing with the barrels. They give us 500 barrels just like this. Normally, the contracts were let out in lots of 500. Give us 500 barrels, and they would, again, test them if they passed their time. They did this with all the metal, metal components. They did it with bayonets and triggers. They took all the metal parts back, and they put them in the Tower of London in the warehouse around the tower. And when they needed, say, 100 muskets, they take out any 100 barrels, any, any 100 locks, they all pass the same test. And they sent them out to a group of guys called the Rough Stockers, who would take the blank of wood and start to form the muskets. From there, it went to a group of guys called the Setters Up, who finished, took all the little pieces and finished the musket. Now, when the ordinance got it back in their hand, they knew that every component of it, lock, stock, and barrel, down to the smallest group, had met their standards. So these are really quality muskets, but it took a long time to make them. They, they started to put these parts together in 1727, and they didn't hand out these muskets until 1730. It took three years to get them actually in the system. We've got one here, just like how the 1730. It's not a whole lot of them left. But anyhow, that's, so that was one way they made them, through, through these parts that they had already inspected and stored. Then, when uh, times of stress, which was often with, with Great Britain, they were always at war, uh, they run out of guns because it took a long time to make them. So then they would go to gun makers and say, okay, make us up 2,000 brown vests just like this one. They give them a whole gun. 
and they call them complete contract arms. And they're not as finished as well as the, as the, as the ordinance pieces were, but they were functional. Now, Dublin Castle did the same thing. Dublin Castle, they were, they were in charge of that Irish army that I was talking about. They had their own board of ordinance and they did the same thing. They would send out their inspectors throughout Ireland and buy those parts, bring them back to Dublin Castle and have them made it to guns. Or they would go on out and buy uh, complete contract arms just like the English did. So that's based, most of the guns I think were made from the ordnance system manufacturer and then they filled in with, with these complete contract arms. Yes, sir. Were these parts interchangeable? No. No, they weren't. Uh, they were basically handmade. The, 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 uh, the reason they made the metal parts first is the locks would have a certain difference in them, but they, they were all functional. So when they sent that out to the stocker, the stocker would have to adjust for the lock. But they were not like the French parts. French muskets of the era were very uh, uniform. Uh, you, could, you could drop a lock from Charleville into, into any one of those French muskets and they fit, but not, not so with the pretty pieces. Yep. How about the, the age, so they say the Belgian muskets, how did they fit in? Like, yeah, well, Charlie throughout the entire period of the 18th century, um, there was never enough muskets. So they, they would go to Liège, they actually would send, uh, the, uh, the ordinance of England would send over ordinance inspectors to go to Liège and have muskets made up, ground best muskets made up in Liège. They did that for the entire, for the entire system, from right from 1730 to the end of the century they did that. Did, did they send parts there? They, they sent parts there, make them just like this. They, they sent what they called, uh, I'm trying to think of the pattern parts. But they were, actually they sent a pattern musket. Say, here's a musket, take the parts out of here and make your parts just like this. How was the quality? Uh, not bad. Not bad. The, uh, the engravings and stuff like that are as, as sharp. You can see that, but the muskets themselves are, are, are pretty close. How many marks But they looked all the same. They looked the same. Theory, you can tell a Liège gun because the, um, the engraving on it is a different lettering style. It actually used a double line, uh, so it like, gives it a shaded look. Also, for whatever reason, the locks weren't marked with uh, with the broad arrow stamp. One of the marks that's put on all British ordnance locks is a stamp mark of an arrow, a uh, uh, crown of a broad arrow, and that's an ownership mark that shows that this is the property of the of the government. So anybody caught with that in their hand is going to get hung for stealing. Uh, that's basically what they did. That. But the actual. But in Liège, they didn't. They didn't put the mark on like that. I don't know why. They didn't. But the actual locks looked all the same. All the same. And now, like the early ones were the banana lock. Well, that's the early, that's the earlier pattern, 1730, 1748, uh, up to 48. And they made those too. They because through the entire period, I I've never seen a, a Liège first model or one way pattern musket. But D. Wood Bailey, who knows more about this than anybody, says they were making. Them. They might have them in the Tower of London, but I've never seen one of the collectors. The French ones were all interchangeable locks? Much better, much more interchangeable. How, how, uh, how did they handle the logistics of field maintenance when a part broke or whatever? Well, that was a, uh, one of the, they brought that into consideration when they were actually sending guns. They, the, the British policy of, of arming uh, regiments that were going to go outside the European theater going to go to South America, North America, give them the oldest, lousiest guns, because they never expected to see them again. <laughs> they figured these things are going to break and they couldn't fix them. There was nothing but blacksmiths here. No. You know? So the, the policy is, is the newest equipment didn't come here unless, uh, you know, unless things really, like, like during the revolution, they finally sent the first quality stuff here. French Indian War was all second-hand stuff because they figured the heck with the illusion. Uh, it, it's, he would barely said, like, if at the end of the French Indian War, there were between 20 and 30,000 muskets in storage here in this country. They sent the, 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 the soldiers back, but not without the guns. So they were sitting here, and in, in, in 1769, this is not worth a lot of money. They just sent them back to England, broke them all up, and sold them for parts. So they, I guess they weren't in such great shape for them to do that. They didn't store them. They broke them up and sold them for commercial pieces. Uh, you feel the parts had to be hand fitted. Yeah. So, all the guns that were stored here, uh, none of them were made of all intact? 6,000 said. For all the militias. Uh, it was, I guess, 1764. No, I get that wrong, 1768. 
7064, we're going to store it here, but they, they used a lot of them. This Pontiac thing acted up, and they <coughs> caused a lot of problems. So they armed the militias with these weapons. Once they armed the militias, good chance that some of them ain't coming back. These militia guys took whatever was on the other down. So at the in, in 1768, they they said there's anywhere from 20 to 30 thousand of these muskets remaining from the French Indian War. They decided that I think six thousand would stay here, and the rest would go back to be chopped up for all parts. And I noticed that all all the pieces up here have brass furniture on. Right. <coughs> Did they ever do a weapon like that with steel furniture? Uh, the Irish did. Uh, early. Uh, 1730, 17 stuff like this, 1725, 1730. Right at the beginning of the, of the Brown Best series, they, the Irish had uh, uh, muskets done like that. I think maybe earlier, 1715, you might have had some British muskets done like that. They call them Colonel's muskets. They were pre precursors of the Brown Best. But the, the Brown Bus series itself in Dublin, they started making what I not not many of them made. I, I see one or two of course. Yes, sir. Um, what was the wooden ramrod? Right. At what point did that uh, get retired and replaced by the steel? Uh, 1748 is when the British official did. Uh, they bought was that. Well, they called it 1748 model. Basically, it was 1742, but they changed it to a steel rammer. They changed the, the rammer pipes, and they just put a smaller diameter on it. Uh, originally, they, 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 I should say this, before 1748 uh, some of them were, re were converted to steel rammers. They just put, like, washes or springs in the, in the big wooden rammer feathers, uh, just so that wouldn't rattle around. And in 1748, they officially started putting rammer thimbles that fit a steel band. And they first started at that time to put a nose, brass nose cap on the front. So that's what they call the pattern 1748. It's really not a pattern, it's, it's, it's just a basically upgraded 1742. The brass nose cap, is that innovation to protect the wooden stock from the Yeah, they have a lot of problems. You see some of them here, even if you come up later on, you see we got one here. They used to put a band around it. It really didn't help out much because there was a lot of problems with those things. One of the problems with these, uh, these early brown best buses is that they were very thin at the top. And that's split. Uh, they had, see, everything was paid for by weight. They paid for a stock by weight. And if they wanted to have a real heavy bulge in here, so that they thought that that was good for the soldier to help carry his day in it. But then they had to slim this stock down somewhere else because they weren't going to pay a penny more for it. Everything, everything these guys did with money. So they really made a thin, a very thin edge, and that started to split like there's no tomorrow. They decided to put a brass band on it. Didn't work. So uh, they then made it try to make it thicker. And what they did is they started to eliminate this mid-stock bowl, starting to get thinner. This got thinner, this got heavier. The whole idea was don't charge us any more money. That didn't work. Finally, 1748, they got a brass nose cap that you'll see on, on these, on these uh, 1756 muskets. That worked. They didn't split that. But it took 30 years to get to the <laughs> Yes. And at the old barracks in Trenton, they had an exhibit about a couple years ago on the French and Indian War. And they were showing that these muskets had like four inches of barrel was sliced off and then the stock shortened and all this other stuff. Um, there was a theory that that goes for the, uh, the range, ranger companies doing it. They, they found a whole bunch of barrels cut off the uh, They think they're brown best now. <coughs> on, on Rogers Island in, uh, in the Hudson River up there by Saratoga. And that was a place where Robert Rogers Rangers encamped. And they found these barrels they made the assumption that they took these, they were issued, you know they were issued the, the, the uh, 1730s. They wanted them because they thought they were lighter than the subsequent ones. Then they found a whole bunch of these barrel parts cut off, so they figured that's what the range companies did, just for easier handling of wood. The problem with that is that that island was inhabited for 100 years by 10 different armies. Well, I don't know who, I don't think you can actually say that was Robert Rogers and guys. That was, they were fighting over that thing out there for generations. Yeah. <coughs> yes, sir. What, what kind of transition was it? The predecessor to the flintlock was, was it a match lock? 
Uh, yeah, well, actually, a wheel lock, but that was a very expensive thing. That was a, that was for rich people. Yeah, uh, a match lock, and that was just a piece of rope. They put a mechanism on and they flip it down. That must have been terribly awkward. Yeah, to keep that, what you keep that match going. When, when did that occur? Well, Flintlock started to really uh, emerge uh, universally about 1675. You realize how, how, how long we used the Flintlock mechanism. The Flintlock mechanism was the primary weapon on warfare on Earth for 150 years. It started about 1675 and used it all the way up until the first half of the, of the 19th century. A lot of those guns were, you know, the Civil War guns were reconverted flintlocks. So the flintlock mechanism really worked. 150 years, that's a, that's a lot of history. And the same, it's the same system. Yes? The military rules, when did the, the dog disappear from the outside of the lock? Uh, again, it, it stays like a vestigial part. We have one, we have one piece that's, uh, Probably 1675, it still has it, but it's more of a decoration than it is uh, a functional piece. I think about 1650, I started to that go along. Yes, sir? Uh, the use of pins to hold a barrel, was that an economy move instead of using micro barrel bands? It might have been, but it's, it was a bad economy. It was, on, that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> See, when you. Uh, uh, you know, do something. The way these, these guns are, are, the British kept their, uh, put their, attached the barrel to the stock, is that they, they put the barrel in the, they had loops welded onto the bottom of it. So they put it into the barrel recess, they drilled holes, and they put a pin through that would go right through here, through the loop, out the other side, and that's what held the stock. You do this in two or three places. The problem is that when you fire a musket like that, you get a lot of pressure on those pins and the wood around it. So consequently, when you use that kind of system, you've got to have a heavy, robust stock. The French um, did this. They didn't use those barrel loops on the bottom. They put the barrel in the recess, and then they put these bands over it and held them in place with springs. Now, when you fire this musket, you're getting an awful lot of way of pressure is going on those barrel bands, not on the wood. Consequently, you could use a lot of a lighter piece of wood. So this this thing weighs about eight pounds. That British piece weighs eleven. So this was cheaper to produce, and it had a greater interchangeability of components. You could slap a barrel right on it. We had to just use the same bands. So the French had a, a really a, a better weapon, cheaper to produce. Were, were any of the brown vessels ever produced with a barrel band? Or did you uh, no. No. They they find, I'm not, see, I, I, I don't know a whole lot about the Enfield systems, but I'm sure I think they use barrel bands. That was 1850 stuff when they started using it. Yes, sir? Is there any navigation of the ground test between the regular Army and the Sea Service in the Army? Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, that's, that's real. Uh, that's another question. Yeah. The Sea Service muskets, uh, we have one here. Uh, they. You want to say that they, they used an old system or old components. They didn't. They used stuff that that would, could be readily repaired for its shape. So these other, these other brown vest muskets, they had the locks have a, a rounded surface. To, so this this sea surface piece is flat because if you had a if you had, you had a blacksmith that would ship, he might be able to repair a lock that broke. He couldn't with that because it was it was different. Um, the sea surface stuff. Two, two types uh, they used. One was a, a black short musket, which is 39. You know what You gotta realize, the, especially starting with the French Indian War, the British Army and Navy developed a very high degree of amphibious warfare. They got good at small boat stuff. They were very good. And they used two, boat, two types of muskets. They used what they call a short black musket, 39 inch barrel painted black. And the reason that's painted black is because they could use it at nighttime and it wouldn't, the moon wouldn't reflect off it, wouldn't get the position right. Most people thought that they painted them black to help them, be, you know, preserve from salt air. It's really not the case because at the same time they had an equal amount, every ship had an equal amount of short muskets and long muskets. This is a, a long musket called a, a bright sea surface weapon. Um, anywhere from 42 to 46 inch long barrels. They weren't particular, they, they, they didn't care. So, but as long as they kept half of them bright, for whatever reason, that's what they did. 
we know that those great sea service muskets uh, were taken from the ships in New York Harbor in 1755 and issued to the uh, Virginia militias. They took 600 of them off of there because they lost all their guns and flat. So a lot of those guns were from New York City wound up in, uh, in Virginia, which is where this piece came from. Okay? Who knows? You can't say it was one of those guns. But this is a bright sea service musket. It's the only one I've been able to identify anywhere. I can't even find them in the books. He with Bailey's book, he gives a great, ex uh, great explanation of what they should look like, but he doesn't have a picture. So I don't know where's another one, but they're lucky enough to come across this one. Uh, and as far as the Marine service goes, they, the Marines were only raised in times of conflict. In other words, when there was a war, then they raised the Marines and put them on the ships. They weren't going to pay for a Marine division uh, unless they had to. And uh, when they when they re-raised them in 1739, because of the War of Jenkins Year, they used these type of muscles. And we know this because this is marked for the Marines. This is marked with them on it. Ended up yet. And we, we now just recently got some, some information, newly found information, uh, that this is how they want the Marine Regiment. And this is the Marshall Regiment that we raised from 1744 to 1748, so we know it fits. Uh, they, they, after that, so this was the oldest type weapon in, in existence at that time that they gave to the Marines. Once again, because they're going to be on ships, well, I guess they didn't, didn't think they were going to get them back. Then in 1757, when they French Indian War really broke out seven years ago. Uh, they produced a what they call a marine or militia pattern weapon. They were really worried about an invasion of the English mainland from Europe. So they produced lots of militia companies. They owned them with a very cheap brown vest musket, uh, very rudimentary furniture on them, 40 torch barrel. And they also issued them with Marines. So that, that's what they call them uh, uh, marine and militia pattern weapons. And then once again, once the war ends, the Marines are gone. Until the next war. <laughs> yes, sir. Besides England, Ireland, and the age, uh, were the brown vest muskets produced anywhere else? Yeah, German, and there's German principalities that got kind of all those little states in there, and they were buying them in there. So you can tell those types. Uh, I, don't, I, I don't think I can tell the difference between the age and the German piece. But when you see the proof box on the barrel, they're, they're not engraved marks, they're something, something for two points. That's a sign of a, a German. Right. And, uh, when the India pattern was introduced, what was the main difference? Well, 39 inch barrel. They cut the barrel down, they just made it cheap. They, they, they were the same weapon. The one thing about the long land pattern and short land pattern, they were the same musket. A uh, trained soldier could load and fire one about four times per minute. Effective range of about 80 yards. And that's no different from any of these guns. They could be 60 years apart and make it. They were the same product. That's why they were, they were issued at the same time. They had long and short land pattern muskets being carried in the revolution by the same regiment because they didn't make any difference. Yes, sir. What's the significance of the Marines Screws in the lock. One behind the cock or two behind the cock? Well, okay, what they did is they shortened the piece on the internal lock. So they, they, they each had two screws, but one of them appears behind the cock. If you took this cock off, you find it on the What they did is they changed the, the spring inside so that the bottom, that, that spring wasn't so long that the end came behind the cock. Now it came right here. So and they started that. In officially in 1777, it started with the Indian pattern muskets uh, a little earlier. The East India Company so muskets. So we see two, two screws visible down the Yeah, that's a that's pattern 1777. Short land musket. They were used in America. Okay. Yes, sir. What's the difference between a single bridle block and a double one? Okay. Um, <laughs> This is a single bridle lock. Uh, there's, there's no connection here. See, let me talk about the first one, the single. The first bridle, the single bridle lock, is they took a, 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 a in, inside the lock plate, they put a covering pan over the over the tumbler. Because apparently we're having some problems with the tumbler slipping. So they put a piece in there to hold that in there. And they referred to it as an internal bridle. And that was referred to as a, to differentiate it from 
Huskus before it, it was called a single bridle lock. So the, pre the earlier models, were, they had a bridle. They had an internal bridle. An internal bridle. And they there's go, there's there's no bridle. Yeah. Oh, that's, well, that's called a plain lock, with no internal bridle and with no external bridle. It's called a plain lock. They stopped at about probably 1710, 1710. Uh, then, then they went to the single bridle lock with the military muskets at 1730. And the reason that they, they <coughs> we have the slides for this, the reason that uh, they put a bridle piece in here is because repeated firing tended to bend this screw. And what it did is it offset the angle at which the flesh struck the steel and affected the amount of sparks produced. So they put a, a, a piece, a connecting piece between here and here, stop bending the screw that took care of it. And they're referred to as double bridle locks. So that's a single bridle. This is a single bridle. That's yeah, single bridle. That's single bridle, yeah. And it, it's single, but it's inside, so you can't see it. It's just a cover on the, on the tumble. I got that small one. What happened to all these models and rifles when they were obsolete and replaced? What happened to them? Did they, did they convert them? To the the them? Well, uh, they shipped the thing. You know, they had a lot going on. Right? So uh, they had militias all over, all over the place. Uh, the India. They shipped an awful lot of these obsolete guns to India, <coughs> and, and they armed the, armed the uh, Indian militia troops with them. They always had a militia somewhere that they could give the old stuff to. <laughs> if they didn't have to, they broke them up and sold them off the spare parts. So they didn't turn them into pressure? No. no. Now, I, I, don't, I don't know enough about to say what happened in the 19th century when that came about. I'm not sure about that. I, I, I don't know if the ordinance officially Changed the Indian pattern uh, in muskets to percussion. I'm not sure about that. Someone else. And is it true that Mexico used those at the Alamo? They used them. Uh, they weren't in, percuss in percussion. They were in. Uh, they were 39 inch patterns. They were the Indian pattern muskets. They call these the Indian pattern. You see, the East India Company had their own army, and they produced these 39 inch weapons for their own army in the 1770s. So they had a 39 inch barrel that. that Gun work perfectly well as, as the other ones. The British government didn't take that over until the 1780s and 90s. It go down to the 39 inch pattern. So we call them India pattern muskets because uh, they resemble those from using the, the uh, East India Company. Yes, sir. Uh, the, were both the uh, Brown Bess and the uh, Charleville uh, French, were they all left bright? Pardon? Were they all left bright? Uh, the French and the French? Yes. England. Yes. <coughs> yeah, they, they polished them right. I don't know why, but they did. Also, that there is that bulge, right? I forget, maybe you mentioned it already. And the forearm. Yeah, they don't I don't know. I forget what the reason for that was. Well, that was uh, for the guy to better grip the, the bayonet, for the use of the bayonet. It, it, see, when you fight, you, know, you guys are being actors, and, and, and you know more about guns than I do. Uh, when you fire these old things, when you had 60 men firing them, for, after the first shot, it's a cloud of dust out there. You can't see it. <laughs> so you're going to do two shots and try to stab the guy. You can't see it. <laughs> Battlefields were just obscured with total, total cloud of white powder after the first volley. Over there. Yes, sir. Um, you, you mentioned the economy in manufacturing. It's always economy, economy, economy. Why did the British uh, Focus in on a 75 caliber weapon. The French went for a 69. Was there was it an economy on the ammunition also? I don't know. It was the, the reason they had those large uh, bores in the early 18th century is because the gunpowder was so dirty. Uh, it fouled the barrel up. Fr French finally got it right. French had the best gunpowder in the world. They had a guy like Vassier. French chemist. He produced the best gunpowder in the world. It, it, it left the, less, the least residue of all. Um, the only stuff the British were using was just two shots and you can't get a ball down anymore. So basically the barrel is 75 caliber, the ball is 69. Or 70, 80 caliber. It just had to be lower, lesser than that barrel. Because after two or three shots, you can't, you can't load it. But you have, you have read or see documentation that they 
chose why they said that five thousand barrel for a particular reason. I know the early French ones were heavier barrel. It was seventy five caliber, seventeen, seventeen to stuff like that, seventy four caliber. But then they put it down to sixty nine. And six and the and the ball is about sixty five calories. They had the same problem. Fast they had better time. It wasn't perfect. I had another question, but something else came up. If you go to uh, Liberty Hall in Philadelphia, they have this thing where Congress made a request to the French government for the stuff they wanted. And listed often was muskets that gave you 16 uh, balls to the pound. Yeah, that's, that's the size. Yeah. Um, that's one ounce ball, which is a 69 dollars ball. Right. That's what they were putting out. Yeah. Actually, the uh, Pennsylvania Committee of Safety Rules. You have you have put on the barrel a, a number of, of a number like 16, and that meant that that uh, six. If you took one pound of lead, you could do 16 shots of your one ounce ball. So this barrel is for one ounce ball. You have the mathematicians. <laughs> they had they did that. They had numbers on it. So they charged us. So a, uh, a 16 gauge shotgun is a 69 caliber shotgun. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. And 75 is appropriate. Yeah. So, yes, sir. You mentioned the powder, the French powder. We read, we've all read yeah. that the French powder gave the Americans a significant edge. Yeah. But corning was invented. The corning made reliable powder possible long before. Century. And I'm just curious what the difference, what the French were doing that the English were not getting that made the powder so small. Well, they made that combination, that, that you know, saltpeter and charcoal. Yeah, but the proportion, the, yeah. the percentages were the same as they are today. Yeah. There was a difference in the formulation and granulation. Yeah, I, I just don't know what they did to make it better. I don't know. I just uh, I know I, I've read a number of times that Lavoisier was supposed to be the guy to be the greatest governor. Well, and they were sent that here. I don't know the specific the chemistry of it. I really don't jump into it. Maybe it was Gordon. Maybe. Yes, uh, yeah, in regard to the gunpowder, what I understand is the, the way they produced it, the French powder could take a lot of rough road and still be powder while the British started to separate into its individual components and you have to remix it. Here's our expert on powder. <laughs> uh, what the French basically did was they ground their components much finer than, than the British. It took a lot longer to produce the powder. But they used these huge uh, wooden mills to grind the components. Uh, when you buy powdered sulfur, flowers of sulfur, I don't know if you can yeah. still buy that in the drugstore or not. <laughs> uh, it's ground fairly fine. You know, the French even did better than that. And the same thing, they used uh, charcoal, which was a better quality. And they, the uh, saltpeter mostly came from South America. Yes, one of them. You know, yeah. And, uh, they uh, you know, just were much more careful about refining their, their product. Uh, by the way, if any of you have a basement that's made out of cement or cinder block, or cement block, you know the white powder you get on the on the block when it's very damp out? That's saltpeter. Wow. In case you didn't know hopefully. Really? <laughs> 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 all scraping our foundation. <laughs> yes, the British did the power manufacture wall guns. Yes. Or did they contract the individuals to bring the green muscle? Uh, I'm quite sure they produced uh, walnuts. And those were the ones with screws? Yeah, yeah. 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 I don't know what kind of quantity they produced them, but they produced them. Yeah. 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 Dragoon muskets. Did they all have it manufactured new as a dragoon musket, or did you find some that were later cut down arsenal? Early, before 1744, they actually took these walnut muskets to cut them down. 
Potentially. Yeah, you should have done it there. Andrew Goomcom just took those weapons cut them out. After 1744, they started to uh, produce muskets just in that style, 37 inch barrels, I believe, were the first ones. And that was the first time they used the, the, the expression short land powered musket. That's what they referred to as. So they all have a wooden rim on or steel Those are all wooden rims. So no steel be correct. Uh, as, in, in her 1744, they were all wooden rims. They didn't, uh, I, I guess maybe the 1750s, they started putting them out there. Because it was a big bomb, you know, it was a, there was no gun making made between 1750 and 1755. Then they got involved in that Seven Years' War thing. It started here with the French and the War. They started cranking them out, but they, they produced a better quality piece. They had the long leg pattern muskets had that straight bottom edge lock, not the banana shaped lock. They all had steel rims. So I'm quite sure that they were with that. Had the grass was kept them on. Yeah. Was that the yeah, I'm not sure. So, uh, 1620, the pilgrims, they, they had what they call a, a dog lock, which was like a flint lock. And they, they probably also had the match locks, too. I'm sure they had the match locks. But did they yeah. have the, the flint also? The I don't lock? think they had the flint lock, no. That dog lock? No. Maybe the dog lock. No. No. The, the, the match locks maybe in the snap punch. The match locks of Jamestown. Yeah. Yeah. By the way, that rope fuse on a match lock is basically, I think, cotton roll, and it's saturated. It's soaked in a solution of saltpeter. Yeah. So it burns slowly. And I hope I can get it from Dixie Arms because I have a match lock I want to shoot. Don't scrape your face with the wall. Thanks, thanks. Thank you very much. Besides the that project model, the police said was there any other models that had short barrels in that? I don't think they had short barrels. Sure. That's about a short barrel. Good luck with the sappers and artillery guys and engineers. Would they get the short? Say, yeah. Yeah, the miners, they call them. No matter how they had short barrels. All set? Okay. Yeah. Somebody mentioned percussion. Uh, Brown Besses, I've seen two. One belongs to the Union County Historical Society, and it's obvious somebody made it into a shotgun. They, they took away most of the wood, and they must have had some local gunsmith put it together. Another one I'll bring here, at Fort Lee, some guy used to keep bringing a brown vest that still had the lock and this complicated, you know, mechanism, so you could put a percussion cap instead of, but those seem to be like, almost like prototypes, rather. Than, yeah, I think so. I don't think they will manufacture them. I've seen some you know, elementary ways that they do They converted the percussion. They actually just took the jar of the flip lock and put a handle in it. Yeah, that's one of these ones. Yeah. 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 Um, the manufacturing of uh, percussion and percussion. When did the love for the socket bayonet, what model did that? standard equipment versus the old line of clothing. Well, it's, it's certainly started in the present of the 1730 muskets. Uh, right from the beginning, they had a yeah, right for a the, yeah. the thing about it is, is, you know, is that was a bayonet lug. It wasn't supposed to be used as a sight, but they referred to it as a sight. You've seen the records. They called it a sight. Sometimes it'll be off a quarter of an inch, so I, 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 I can, you're not going to hit the table that far. Yeah. 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 But no, the only the uh, the 1730s it, it has advantages. And then the French they they kept changing their bait and went from the top to the bottom every Sorry. two years. <laughs> so, yeah, so yeah, I yeah. Can't yeah. Make up mind. <laughs> okay, what was that? Question? Yeah. Yes. And in British service, what was the last round vest that was used? What was that model, and what replaced it? Well, see, the, the term brown best we use um, is, is usually used up until the end of the 18th, the 18th century. And then after that, they used those, um, the India pattern muskets from about 1795 on. They went, uh, they, they went into percussion at some time, probably 1840. And primarily conversion? I don't know that. Somebody okay. had mentioned that before it did, but I'm not sure. I don't know about that. Okay. Yeah. 
Yes, sir. Of all the muskets you brought today, what's the timeline of them? Um, 1730, the first of the brown pests here. We just dated 1728, the lock. Yeah. Uh, up until, well, our Revolutionary War pieces. The, the, uh, your latest one we have is a pattern 1777 shortland musket, just like that uh, you, you brought with today. Um, marked for the 60th Regiment, that was a, the uh, Royal American Regiment. Well, I heard, I read something in a book about warfare and world, uh, world history that when the flintlock, when the British started using the flintlock in a totally different part of the world, it's now Afghanistan, <clears throat> that the Afghanis were still using the matchlock. Because the matchlocks had longer barrels and were easier, maybe quicker to load, I don't know, that the actual, the first couple times they came across this, the British with the shorter barrels and a longer time to load and prime and all actually got the, were a significant disadvantage. But I haven't been able to find any corroboration. Usually in the 18th century, the barrel length had something to do with the gun powder. Yeah. The, the theory was that um, it took a long, if it was a slow burning gun powder for it to reach yeah. its full potential of explosion, they need a long barrel. Yeah. So as the gun powder got better, they put the barrels in. I think that's what we'll add some Yeah, uh, I read, I belong to uh, Muzzle Loading Association, and in their magazine they said that uh, the British armed some Indians during the French and Indian War, and it seemed very common that the Indians didn't like the long barrels, and they cut four, six, eight inches. Yeah, yeah. They, they would go in and have the blacksmith yeah. cut the barrels. Yeah. 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 Well, it's like something that come up with Brooklyn Street when I was a kid, you know. <laughs> 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 Zip-cut things, you know. The priest would say, oh, it's not mine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, this is a, this is a this started life as a 1766 French infantry musket. They had 44 and a three quarter inch barrels. They cut it down on uh, about 12 inch barrel. They put it on these rawhide wraps. And what they would do is they would take a piece of rawhide, they'd bend it over and sew it. And they'd soak it, get a good wet, pull it on the barrel inside out so it seemed to go inside, stick it out in the sun. And when it dried, it's a, it's a heck of a repair. Yeah. Repair the but it's a classic blanket. Please repair uh, the wrist on the stock that way also. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. That was very, the Indians did that all the time which they broke the stock because they used their guns for clubs. They didn't use bayonets. The Indians never used the bayonet. They carried the top of all the way. That's the last one. They were close in the fighters. Bill, you want to keep the answer for questions? Did they actually refer to those kind of as a best or is that a normal? No, it's a it's, it's such where that comes from. It shows up in one place in Connecticut, 1777, in a newspaper article. And a guy makes a quote, you really want, maybe 1771, probably, before the revolution. And a guy makes a quote that if you want your if you want to preserve your country, you get brown pests on your shoulder and march. The only time we saw it anywhere earlier than then it comes about in the 19th century through poetry and prose. Kipling made a lot out of it, you know, when he's got to out of service. So when it actually started, but that's that's the, it's, a, it's a contemporary quote of the Brown Best, but I didn't see it anywhere else. There was any Connecticut Quorum was the man was the newspaper. You know, see, they, they, they used to, they did have a contemporary uh, uh, nickname for the generation before that. These guys had big pikes. Well, those, those things were painted brown, but those things were painted, and they called them the brown bill. And that was a contemporary term used by pikemen in the 1600s. Whether that has any translation into the, into the 1700s, who knows? You taught us two things, though. Uh, you taught us about the 19th, uh, 18th century war. One of them is that when you did a question and answer session, it was at least as interesting as the science. Oh, well. <laughs>